At the end of a day spent throwing, I often take the clay that's left over in the bag and throw one last form, usually to sit on a wheel overnight and dry out slowly. And that pot today was a rather large, wide, shallow bowl. Generally speaking, I always know what it is I'm going to throw before I start making. In this case, I knew I wanted the bowl to be large and shallow, but I didn't know exactly which kind of form I wanted. As always, this process begins with centering the clay, which is certainly a little more tricky when it's a larger mass like this. After giving it a really good wedge on my workbench, I make sure I cone it up and down rather a lot until the large mass of clay feels more or less totally centered, which does take time for myself especially, perhaps, as I really don't practice throwing big pots all too often. Nonetheless, I always enjoy the process. I like the physicality of it and how it makes you use so much more of your hands and arms in the process as compared to throwing smaller work, which can often be done mostly with your fingertips and fingers. Once the clay is centered, I make a rough hole in the middle and then push quite far down. For this bowl, as I want it to have a foot ring, I need to leave about two or two and a half centimeters in the base of clay at the bottom of this well. Once that depth is set, I don't push down in the center any further as it would diminish the amount of workable material I'll have later on. With my hands held very firmly, I pull the walls of the bowl horizontally towards me. Working gradually, I ease the base out and then once I'm ready, I wedge a knuckle right at the base of the wall, which is met on the inside with the pads of my fingers on my left hand and together they squeeze the clay upward. There's a tiny wobble on this piece. You can see the rim undulating just a little bit as it rotates, but it isn't severe enough to warrant me stopping or dealing with it. On larger forms, if it does get worse, it tends to be something I'll either remove towards the end of the process, or if I can trim it away once the piece is leather hard, I prefer to do that. As I'm throwing larger bowls, I try to keep the rim quite substantial as I feel like it really adds stability to the piece as I throw it and as it dries too. I do in fact thin it out, but that won't be until the piece is leather hard. Here's a cross section of more or less how I want the pot to look at this thrown stage. It's important when making larger bowls with walls that overhang quite significantly to throw a base that's wider than what you might think is necessary. This excess clay on the outside of the foot ring to the left and right here, supports the overhanging walls at this thrown stage and helps to prevent them from collapsing as you throw them. So in my mind's eye, as I'm throwing, I try to envision a cross section like that. For these bowls, probably the most important thing, and for any bowl really, is making sure that the interior form has a smooth curve from rim to rim. I don't want, say, a flat base, which then leads into curved walls, or straight walls with a curved base. Instead, I want one continuous curve. Now that the form of the pot is more or less there, I begin to remove the excess slip from the inside, and while these spirals might look nice, even if I were to leave them, as this slip dries, they'll become less apparent, and ultimately, my glazes would cover them. So it's for that reason that I don't try and remove all of them. If I were to use glazes that showed the marks with a lot more detail, even when covered, then I would spend more time making sure that the inside is totally pristine. And as you can see, there are a few little bubbles I'll have to pop and deal with. But for the time being, I'll leave the bowl attached to the wheel overnight. This is two or so days later now. The bowl was removed from the wheel where it had been drying slowly overnight and then I flipped it over onto a large bat so that the thick base of clay had ample time to dry out. Ideally, I want to trim this on the metal wheel head, but as there wasn't much of a groove underneath, I couldn't easily lift it away. So all I'm doing here is trimming in an undercut, which will allow me to lift the pot up and move it around at this stage with greater ease. It doesn't quite fit, but it should be fine as the weight of the vessel should be enough to hold it down and keep it in place as I trim. You could also brush the wheel head with slip 
where it'll come into contact with the rim of the bowl, which would stick it in place. I then mark the outer diameter of the foot ring with a sharp potter's needle, and then begin to trim away excess clay from the outside of the form, which are all the areas marked with grey here. And although this diagram isn't completely accurate as compared to the pot I have on the wheel at the moment, which does have thicker walls towards the top, it should give you a good idea of the amount of clay that's removed and from where. Now I can begin the satisfying process of turning the walls and removing lovely long ribbons of clay. These quickly fill up the wheel tray and thankfully all these excess shavings are easily recyclable. I just dump them straight into a large basin of water which sits directly to the left of my wheel and as they're so thin they quickly slake down and disintegrate into a fine slurry which can then be spread out on plaster bats so that the moisture is removed and once it's back to a usable consistency I wedge it all up ready to use again. It's always worth watching not only what the tool is doing but what the hands do too. As I trim I constantly try to keep my two hands connected in some way. Here by my thumbs although at this point it is a totally subconscious effort. Doing this adds stability to your movements which is vital for trimming. You want to be the one in control ideally. If a bump or slight undulation comes along you want to be using enough pressure and force to trim right through it instead of letting that discrepancy influence your turning. As you can see, there was quite a lot of extra material to trim away on this piece, which can happen when you're making individual one-off pots, which you aren't so accustomed to making. This groove I'm trimming in now acts as a glaze catch for when the piece is fired. As the glaze cascades down when it's white hot, it'll pool into this groove and hopefully not onto the kiln shelf. Here's a cross section to show you sort of what I mean. The white section is the turned clay and the green hue that surrounds it is the glaze and as you can see the groove which I was turning where the arrow points gives the glaze an area in which it can gather in without flooding over and spilling onto the lower section of the foot. If the foot ring instead of having this defined shape was instead straight I'd say I'd have a lot more kiln disasters as the glaze really likes to move on these overhanging walls. It also provides a good grip from which to lift it away from and I'm holding it just at this moment to feel the weight of the pot, to check the walls of the piece and to see if I've trimmed everything to an amount I'm satisfied with. And this was more or less there. I think there was a tiny amount extra I needed to take out just before the foot and don't worry about the rim at the moment. That's something I'll trim finer later on once the rest of the pot is finished. These bison trimming tools I bought last year still razor sharp it honestly makes this process so much more enjoyable and the clay just leaps away effortlessly although i would say as i've now been glazing and firing pots for a couple of weeks i have had some casualties due to pots that were trimmed too thinly which i think is an effect of using these tools so i'll be a little more careful in my next making cycle once the outer section has been trimmed it's time to turn away the inside of the foot ring which is a trickier process and it's usually when something goes wrong, if something does go wrong. But essentially, I'm trying to trim a cross section where the curve, both on the inside of the form and on the outside, flows in one continuous arc and the foot ring doesn't interrupt the curve. In fact, it looks as if it could have just been stuck on. And in fact, some potters do just throw the foot ring onto perfectly curved shapes. But I'd much prefer trimming away clay to reveal the foot ring. I also feel as if the bowl will inherently be stronger as it's all carved from one piece. I begin to remove clay from inside the foot bit by bit, working my way from the centre to the outside and you can see just how firmly I'm gripping the turning tool and lock my hands together in an attempt to keep my movements as sturdy and as controlled as possible. And although you can't really see it, I also lean my upper body weight onto my arms and hold my elbows into my torso. It's so easy at this point to let the clay influence your movements. All it takes is for your tool to get caught 
or snag on something, and in one second it could pierce a hole or trim away too much from the outer portion of the foot ring. So you'll notice at this stage I'm just trying to remove excess clay. I don't mind if anything looks messy at this point, and I'm especially careful when working on this outer edge. There's a lot of stopping and starting during this procedure, as inevitably the coils of clay end up piling back into the footwell, so as I trim, I'm constantly having to remove these. My aim here, in terms of depth, is to trim down to a level so that the base matches the height of the walls on the outside of the foot ring. And in this case, with a deep foot ring, it really meant removing quite a lot of clay. But I can't complain. Trimming is, I think, easily my favourite process. And once most of the trimming's done, I use a metal edge just to smooth over some of those turning marks. And once the inside of the foot well is turned, I change my attention to the foot ring itself, defining the facets and edges and really just neatening up the form. The foot ring itself, for a pot this large, needs to be rather substantial. If it were very thin, there's a good chance the ball would sag and change shape during the firing. The last step for the foot is to stamp it with my maker's mark, which I hand carved myself from a block of porcelain. I push it into the foot ring on an area that won't be glazed, and then as the process of pushing the stamp in displaces the clay upward, I trim this section of the foot again to ensure that it's nice and flat. Now there still is one section left to trim, and that's the rim of the pot. I carefully flip the piece over, placing it down very gently on the freshly trimmed foot. I then gently tap centered the pot so that the rim portion of the vessel was centered and spinning true. I then pushed three soft lumps of clay very gently into the foot just to hold it in place. If taps entering it or pushing these lumps of clay into the foot deform or slightly mark the foot ring, I can always clean them up later on once the rim is finished. And all I'm going to do is add a beveled edge. I'm refining what was quite a flat and chunky rim into one that's far more refined and sharp, one that will hopefully pierce through the glaze that will eventually be coated onto this piece in a nice way. And once again, as I trim, you can see that I'm holding the tool with two hands and I'm leaning my upper body weight onto my left arm, which is also braced against the plastic splash pan of the wheel, all so that the tool at the end of my hand remains as steady and still as it can possibly be whilst applying considerable pressure once the rim has been trimmed, which certainly isn't something I do for all of my bowls, I burnish over the edge with a sharp metal kidney just to soften the clay and to smooth the surface as these sharp bison trimming tools do have a tendency to chatter slightly, especially with grogged stoneware bodies. I then scrape out all the turnings and will just check the interior form quickly and if it needs the curve of this rib scraped over it. This is when I'll do it. And that's the pot more or less finished. I will double check the base just to make sure no burrs of clay have pressed into the bottom of the foot ring where it's now in contact with the wheel. Otherwise I'll just let it dry out slowly with some plastic slung over it most likely so it turns bone dry evenly not just from one side, which could cause it to warp or deform slightly. And generally speaking, if I'm ever flipping it, like I just did, I do so between two wooden bats, rather than picking it up and flipping it over with my hands. As always, thanks for watching. And here's just a few last moments of cleaning up the form, smoothing over any razor sharp edge and making sure that it's all crisp.